as good or bad as the other, and there are no preferences between them. But if your boss doesn't tell you that, you may still know that you can stay home, right? But then that is a worse case than showing up for work. So you know, it's explicitly being given a permission moves the world in which you do that action, right? You actually take that action up to here. It says, these are not bad, they are good, right? That's what it says. When your boss tells you you may stay at home, you already knew that, right? You may, of course you may stay at home, in a, in a sense, right? It's possible, of course, but it's a bad choice. Now that your boss say, said it, it's no longer a bad choice. What has changed? Nothing about what you believe you can do, right? You knew you can stay at home, you still do that, you still know that. What has changed is the preferences here. Now you know that staying at home worlds are not so bad. They are not, well, not, calling them slight, talking in terms of possibilities with the other readings is not so good. Um, but let's, let's stay with this. They are not slight possibilities in this technical sense. They are good possibilities. Okay. Do you see that difference? What has happened between not having the permission and having the permission? Your possible courses of action look different after that. But there aren't any new ones, right? Not necessarily, because you knew you can stay at home. Right, so the human possibility gives us a stronger notion than what we had before in terms of the diamond. The human necessity gives us a weaker notion than what we had before in terms of the box. And for language, so already we have four notions and not two. And the two intermediate ones, these human ones, they are usually what, is, what we do, what we employ in using models like this. Also, you know, for possibility we have can and may and might, and so on. Again, there, you know, why is it that if you are in a windowless room talking to someone at home, say, you haven't looked outside, and uh, you are told that it may be raining outside. Why is it then that, that, that then you take your umbrella with you? But if, you, if the person doesn't say so, you, you don't. It's not that you consider it impossible that it's raining. You know it's likely, right, after the, it has been said. Right. Now if possibility it may be raining were only analyzed in terms of compatibility, then you, 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 know, you can never be sure that it's not raining outside, especially in Japan, right? Especially now in uh, typh Typhoon. <laughs> um, so you, have, you, you don't really rule out that possibility, but uh, it, if someone tells you about it, they say it's not just possible, but it is a, you know, it's, it's not just one of these possibilities, it's one of these possibilities. That makes it more prominent. So you can account for these effects, for these consequences on your actions that uh, follow when someone tells you that it's, you know, it may be raining. And that's a pretty good result because in, in uh, pure modern logic, it's really hard to do that can't really say what changes. I mean, you, if you haven't ruled out the possibility of rain earlier, then what does the assertion that it may rain change? What do you learn from that? Nothing, right? It was possible, you still know it's possible. So um, it has become a bit more possible in a way. And that's, you know, this, this, this is trying to get at that. Of course, then you, to, you, know, you still need this ordering source for that to work. So in a way, you have pushed the hard questions into this ordering source, which is really just a sort of vague 
parameter, which is never really totally nailed down, but at least there's a way of talking about these things. Right. Yeah, so, and this comparative, do you have this somewhere? Comparative possibility. P is more possible that, or oh, I should say, than Q on my handout, at page six. P more possible than Q. Um, well, and it basically says what you might think it would say. It's not so surprising the way this is spelled out. Um, and I think this is taken directly from the paper. So uh, every Q world, for every Q world, there is a P world that is at least as good. And then there, is a, there are some P worlds for which there is no Q world that is at least as good. Okay. So all the Q worlds are outranked in goodness or in likelihood by some P world or other. And then P is more likely than Q, that's all, that's what it says. Right. So, we get this comparative notion, this relative likelihood between worlds. We don't get a measure of goodness or likelihood. We don't get probabilities or anything like that. Not from this system. But we can do lots, lots, many of the things that we could do with probabilities. But it's a um, simpler system. So it's um, that's, that's what people use in linguistics. Do you have any questions now? Yes. The question is, um, one a doesn't so this all this 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 whole story about example one a and b does this require that one a is also modal in some sense? It doesn't require it. if you if you see what Kratzer says about it. In fact, I say uh, there's a, there's a footnote there. If you see see what she she says about it. No, uh, at least what she says doesn't require that. Although, so there, um, if you assume that your model base is realistic, that is, your accessibility relation is reflexive, okay, if you assume that, then necessarily P entails P, right? That's the, that's the axiom. Um, so then she can, she can get around your question by saying, Okay, suppose it is reflexive. Then one B entails one A. But you might believe one B without believing one A, or say one B without being ready to say one A. Okay. And there's of course a different answer that one could give to your question. I would in fact say something else, namely that yes, one A is also modal doesn't have a model, but it, it, is re it is interpreted relative to a set of worlds, a model base. Pretty much everything is interpreted relative to a model base. Let's try to re you see it tomorrow in this paper that you're reading. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so,
あのインディカティブ三ジャンプで形式できちんと書かれてる言語もありますよね。そうすると。はい。しかしそれには関係ないかもしれない。<笑>それの違いは、<笑>その違いは、リフレクシブかどうかとか、リオディスティックかどうかとかじゃないかと思います。<笑>つまりインディカティブは、あの<笑>モデルベースのすべての可能世界で死んである。なおかつ、本当の可能世界もそこに入っている。うん、サブジャンクティブはそうじゃない。こうじゃん、こう。かもしれない。まあ、それもちょっといろいろ議論があるけど、そうじゃないかと思いますけど。Um, if you talk、uh, not, not in terms of distortions, but about beliefs, then you probably don't have to face that question anyway, because you know, if you assume that I Can believe one B without believing one A, then you're pretty safe. And to show that actually would need some time. Uh, the, the idea is this um, if believing a sentence, I believe P, means that in all your belief worlds, P is true. Okay, now I believe A, one A, that is simple. In all my belief worlds, this is the road to Springfield. So it's like a, a modal. Quantification that comes from the word belief in this in this time, right?、Um, now, you would have to show that that is equivalent, believing one A in this sense is equivalent to believing one B. To show that, you need to refer to the properties of the accessibility ratio, specifically that it's Euclidean and transitive, it's introspective. If that's the case, then you believe that. P must be the case if and only if you believe that P is the case. This is, it's, it's a bit tricky. I'm not sure if this is easy to follow, but、um, then if, if your toxastic accessibility relation has those properties, introspection, and you put the word belief in front of both 1A and 1B, then they are equivalent under this classical. Interpretation in terms of universal quantification. Now, we're we'll talking we talk about belief, which is not a model really, right? It's one of these propositional attitude verbs. To the extent that they are the same, or that you, know, you have similar phenomena on both sides, that is、um, a way of illustrating the problem without saying that 1A is a modalized sentence. But tomorrow I will say that 1A is more. Sentences like 1A have a necessity model in them. <laughs> I'm, not the door, I'm not the only one who says that. I think we should stop and come together at two again. <coughs> Next one. So. Um, I want to go back once again to the definition of the ordering, sorry,、uh, the, the definition of the, ne the necessity model with regard to the ordering source that is、uh, what's called here human necessity.、Um, just in case it was a bit unclear, in fact,、uh, I think I was a bit unclear、uh, when I explained why it is so complicated.、Uh, to say this again, so let me write it on the board again because it's, it's useful to know why. It's done this way. So it says for all worlds U, right, in the model base, in F of W,、um, I need the intersection sign, in F of W, there is a、um, V in this such that. Now, first of all, V is at least as good as U. And, and then it had for all z in this intersection, if z is at least as, at, as, at least as good as v, then p is true at z. And so、uh, if this is the case, then p is a What she calls a human necessity. And、um, 
So you might wonder uh, why is it so complicated and if you try to think of simpler way of stating these conditions then you'll see that it wouldn't work. So again you have this modal base here, whatever, so let's, let's, let's do it this way and then here there is the ordering source and these are the worlds in the intersection. Okay. Now you might try to say that, well something you certainly would not want to say is that uh, P is a human necessity, P is a human necessity if and only if it's true at all the worlds in the modal base. That's what we want to get away from, right? Um, so you, you really have to say something like, um, for each of these worlds here, uh, using only part of this definition but not all of it, for each of these worlds, um, let's, see, let's put this in here, um, for all you in modal base, there is a V in the modal base such that V is at least as good as U and V is in P. Why wouldn't you want to say that? Isn't that enough? Because this already tells you that no matter where you are, there will always be a P world between you and the ideal. Right? Doesn't it say that? It doesn't quite say that, and this is the reason why she doesn't use it in the end, because, and you may not recognize this, that's why I should have sort of stopped explaining something, um, because I sort of, I was confused. But if you have two worlds in here, say, okay, or anywhere in one of these things, right, and um, P is true here and false here, right, and they are, in fact, suppose now, you know, you have finitely many worlds. So they are actually the closest ones. There isn't anything else between them and the edge of the modal base, so to speak. Right? Then, let's call them W1 and W2. Then you have W1 and W2 both standing in this relation, right? because uh, the set of propositions that they make true is the same, right? So W2 is also at least as good as W1, okay? And then you can see that this is the case, but you wouldn't want this to be the case, right? For W1, there is a world that is at least as good as W1 where P is true, and for W2, there is a world that is at least as good as W2, and P is true. However, there is a non-P world that is not um, outranked with respect to this ideal, right? So you wouldn't want that. And that's why it's a bit cumbersome here. There's this other clause which helps you ensure that this doesn't happen because it's precisely because of the B clause that um, these two worlds um, don't qualify. So this, this W2 actually now uh, becomes a problem because, see, um, for W2, yes, there is a world that's at least as good as W2, but this in turn has alternative worlds that are at least as good as it and where P is false. See that how it sort of goes back and forth, and why you have these two quantifications here, up here and then here. So you can really make sure that um, you rule out all these cases. Did that help? Do you see that now? Why you have this? And uh, you have this this approaching theme here to begin with, because, like I said, you may not be guaranteed that there are best worlds, if there are infinitely many, and you can approach them, the ideal, arbitrarily far without reaching an end, then you need something like this above structure here. Okay, another thing I wanted to say is that um, remember that F and G, the modal base and the ordering source, 
can be different, and it, in fact, it only makes sense if they are different, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense to say you have an epistemic model base F, and perhaps the same ordering source G, which gives you the same set of propositions. That doesn't work because, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's sort of um, trivial then, right? The ordering source doesn't do any work for you. So it has to be something else. You want to rank one set of worlds that you get from one set of propositions with regard to a different set of propositions. So the epistemic model base, for instance, it gives you the possibilities. And then you can rank them by your preferences or by the laws or by some other criterion. Okay. And it's usually applied in this way that the model base, in fact, I mean, it's not required by the system, but it's, it often happens that the model base is something like an epistemic or, as she calls it, circumstantial model base that is certain relevant facts right, about the world. And then the order that you impose on those worlds is given by something like preferences or desires or obligations and so on. So that you can then base your decisions, you know, which choice to make among all the applicable actions that you can take. You can base your decisions on those other criteria, not just what's possible, but what's better than others. Are there any questions about this? So, I mean, what I just said was in response to a question. So there may be others as well. I think it might be a few. Yeah. <笑>日本語でも。ま、ちょっと、ちょっと大きく。辛いと思うだいって言ってるんですけど、今日の朝やったのは到達可能性の関係が入ったそのモーダルベースサブセットはい、あ、だいつそうそうそう。つまり、あの、これと今朝の関係がどうかということですか。あの、はい。そうですね。え、今朝だいたい言ってのはこう、V of V <laughs> this is true uh, if and only if not. Uh, yeah, I, remember, I gave you these two ways, right, of, of uh, writing this condition down. So one was uh, for all w prime such that w r w prime v w prime p equals one. The other uh, way of writing it was um, if and only if RW, right, is a subset of the denotation of this um, P. So um, these are saying the same thing. And now with the modal basis, you can, that's why I, I pushed this a little bit because this reminds you perhaps more of what we have said so far. Um, none of this involves any kind of more, uh, ordering source, that sort of thing, right? So um, we can just uh, transcribe this, as it were, by using these different um, terms. Let me stay with this notation, V of W, right? So um, now, well, Simple necessity, we can still write it with the box. Is that okay? Simple necessity P equals one if and only if 
And now just it, the only change is really that instead of RW, we write this thing, right? That's what it is. It's the same thing. F of W is not the same, but the intersection is the modal way. I mean, it's a set of worlds, right? And this has to be a subset of this denotation. Rather, well, let me I'll write, keep writing it this way. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not too fussy about the um, the notational conventions because we are reading different papers and these things change anyway, right? Um, okay, so. Now, since you don't have an ordering source, it's pretty easy, I think, to see that this is equivalent to this in the absence of an ordering source. So if suppose suppose your G of W is empty, I can actually write this down. So um, if G of W is the empty set, then the order that you induce on the modal base is universal. That is, all the worlds in the modal base are connected with all others. Because they all satisfy the empty set of propositions, right? And so the set of propositions that they satisfy is always a subset of so the propositions that some other world satisfies. So do you all see that? Um, so for all worlds in the modal base, W1, W2, you have arrows all, you know, going all around. That means that these conditions here that refer to the ordering source are trivially satisfied, right? Um, I mean, every world is at least as good as you. You itself, as well as others, okay? Um, so if you now think about what this means is, uh, you, you see that for all worlds you, okay, in the moral base, there is one that is at, at least as good as it, okay, so far so good. But then for this V, it has to be such that all worlds that are at least as good as it make P true. Well, the whole modal base is at least as good as V, right? All of them. So in order for this V in particular to come out true, now, with the empty ordering source, um, P has to be true in all of them. Because from this V, we can, we can still access all of them. Before, we couldn't go back, so to speak, right? We couldn't, we traveled in this one direction following this increasing goodness of the worlds. So with an empty ordering source where the, um, the comparison relation is everything, this comes down to simple necessity, indeed. And then if you check it, uh, the um, so human necessity and simple necessity, are, they coincide in this case. You can then also check that precisely for that reason, the human possibility and simple possibility coincide because they are defined as the duals of these necessities. Right? It's possible if and only if the negation is not necessary. Now if that notion of necessary is the classical one, that is the simple necessity, then the dual of that becomes just our familiar possibility. So that's how they are really closely related. And you only get a different result if you have an interesting ordering source of some kind, right? If there are some propositions in there, and, uh, and besides, they also have to be propositions that somehow distinguish between these worlds, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, or it doesn't make any difference if you have a, an ordering source that stays wholly outside of this, right? There has to be something, mean, it has to be something, to say something about these worlds, right? So only then do you get a difference between this classical necessity and this weakened necessity. Good, yes, that was a good question, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, are there any questions still about this difference between slight possibility and human possibility? 
Remember, uh, I said um, this may account for the fact that a sentence like it may rain usually carries information. It is a problem in classical logic to say why such sentences can be informative because um, you often learn something from them even if you have not ruled out the possibility of rain. Right? You may just, you may really not know it. You may, you may, so with your knowledge, it may be compatible that it's raining outside. But you think it's very unlikely. In that case, the sentence, it may rain, if someone says that to you, that makes a difference. You'd pick up your umbrella and take it with you, perhaps. And you wouldn't have done that otherwise. So what has changed? Well, perhaps, like I said before, what the person told you is not only are there uh, not only are there rain worlds somewhere in this modern base, but there are actually some rain worlds among the likely ones. If that's what it means, then you can explain that something has changed in response to the assertion, right? In your beliefs. So that's how this, you know, it's human possibility. Like I said, it, it makes a stronger assertion because, or you know, for the same reason that the human necessity makes a weaker assertion. Right. Yes. Uh, I keep looking at you. You didn't actually ask that question. Sorry. Okay. Anything? Uh, anything else? No. Well, then, there are these other examples where these ordering sources may come in handy, maybe useful. Um, we can go quickly on the next two and then uh, say a bit more about conditionals, perhaps, because there they are also quite relevant. Whereas with these normative rankings and these practical inferences, those are not genuinely linguistic problems. They are about behavior and inference and so on. But still, it may be useful to, to look at it briefly. The, um, the first one. Um, <clears throat> just shows you that the, the notion of comparative possibility can be helpful in explaining why um, statements like five, or what they mean, right, when they are true, statements like five. So if you, um, so let's see, given the state of your health, so this is now with respect to some uh, some uh, uh, modal base, right? A, a modal base that says something about the facts, about circumstantial things, right? Um, modal base which contains some other things. The fact that you are a, a tuberculosis patient, perhaps because Davos was used to be in the old days a resort for those people. Uh, when they were still, when there were still many of them in Europe, and um, so with regard to one, this is perhaps a slightly different case here because we're not talking about different ordering sources necessarily, but about different modal bases, right? Given the state of your health, um, you have perhaps this modal base, health. Well, actually, uh, since this is a fact, we should really put the world in here because these are supposed to be facts that are true at the world of evaluation, right? So we have W in here, and we have this intersection of F of W, which gives you all the relevant facts that are relevant to this judgment, what to do, right? Where to go. Health. Health is a concern. Well, given that, you should go to Davos, or because, um, well, you want to be near a world, where, uh, well, in a place where these uh, very well, where these health problems are taken care of, right? 
Now, given that you like the sea more than the mountains, you should go to Amsterdam rather than to Davos. Uh, that's, that's a different case than here you have these desire worlds which determine what is best. Okay, And you may want to go to Amsterdam, but for other reasons you may prefer to go to Davos. Does that make sense? You see that? The thing here is that 5a and b, without these bracketed uh, prefixes, right, just the sentences themselves, you should go to this rather than that, can be true with respect to one and false with respect to the other in the same model. Okay? The same model. And we've already basically said that before, but this is an example here. Practical inferences. Uh, this is something I would like to skip for now. Maybe we have time for this at the end. Okay, because like I said, it's not really about language, it's about making decisions. So perhaps we can get back to this if there is time and if we want to. We don't have to. We'll see. Um, it tells you how to resolve contradictory desires. But let's talk about conditionals for a, a moment here. If sentences, if A then B, um, we haven't said much about them, but they also play an important role in this whole theory and in the motivation for the ordering sources. Uh, you probably know that there are various ways of spelling out the truth conditions for an if A then B sentence. In formal logic, the um, you know this arrow as it's usually written, or sometimes with this sign, right? And we already had that. So you would say that V of this at a world is true if and only if B W of A is zero or V W of B is one. And perhaps I don't have to convince you that this is a bad idea to treat conditionals in this way. There are some arguments for that here. There are many more arguments that everyone runs into when you learn this in your logic classes. So for instance, you know, remember, well, as it's, as it's said here, you have these truth, the rows in your truth table, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero, that tell you that the conditional is true whenever the antecedent is false, the antecedent being A, antecedent and consequent, Zenken and Koken. Okay. Um, I'm looking for my yellow chalk. Ah. So here, especially in these cases, right, uh, the truth of the conditional does not depend on the truth of B whenever A is false. That is very unintuitive because it means, as it says here in the handout, for instance, in seven, today is Saturday. Suppose that is the case. If today is Saturday, in fact, then B is predicted to be true. If today is Friday, it is raining. And if today is Friday, it is not raining. These can both, well, they are both true in this case, right? Under this analysis, that doesn't make sense. And these other ones, seven C, um, if, um, well, 7c, it is not the case that if the team wins, I will be happy. That is the negation of a conditional it is predicted to be true in just one case, namely this, right? So the conditional should be equivalent to the team will win and I will be unhappy, which, of course, uh, is also nonsense. It's not. It's not equivalent to that. An alternative analysis of conditionals it came out of counterfactual conditionals, but um, has also been used for, you know, for conditions in general, is to uh, state it in terms of this subset relation between worlds. Right? So if A then B is true whenever 
the A worlds are a subset of the B worlds, okay? But again, this doesn't really conform to uh, intuitive judgments in all cases. It's, it's already better than this, certainly, um, because uh, some of the examples, the, some of the ones on the handout, they are already ruled out, but other bad inferences remain. Um, for one thing, let's see. Where are they? Um, you have, to, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here to page nine, number 10. We have these two sentences here. If this material is heated to 500 degrees, I'll write this down here. If this material is heated, I just say heated for, for, to be brief, it will burn. And if this is heated and put in a, oh, there the order is different. Um, sorry, I, I'll go with what's in the handout. If this material is placed in a vacuum chamber and heated, it will burn. Um, the first sentence can be true, while the second one is false, right? That's a problem. First of all, if we consider this, this subset relation here, if this is a condition on all the possible worlds, then it doesn't make any sense at all, right? Just, um, that the first, that it should be possible that the first is true while the second is false, because the, the, the set of worlds where the material is heated <coughs> or placed in the vacuum chamber and heated is a subset of the worlds in which it is heated, right? Yes? yes. And if the, the set of worlds in which it is heated is a subset of those where it burns, then this, which is a subset of the worlds where it's heated, must of course also be a subset of those where it burns, right? So uh, it should be impossible for the first one to be true while the second one is false. And to rule out this sort of thing, the ordering source is also helpful. But first, there's another thing, another, uh, another thing we should uh, keep in mind that uh, this is not the right way to interpret these conditionals to begin with because the set of all worlds presumably is a set of all logical possibilities. All, everything, right? Everything that can be conceived of. And uh, I would say in a case like this, so this is about some particular piece of material, 500 degrees and so on, then it will heat, okay. But it is logically possible for it to be heated to 500 degrees and not burn. There are worlds where that's the case, where the material is just, you know, the, the laws are slightly different, the laws of physics. There's certainly a possibility. It's not like there is no world that is like that. Um, so if we say that this conditional is true, then we already have restricted our attention to some subset of the set of all worlds, right? Because there are these far-fetched outlandish possibilities that we just don't consider. So, um, yellow. Um, so the, the idea is, is in, in reality, we should actually have something like this. That, uh, you know, A may not be a true subset of B, but if we restrict our attention to some some area like this, then A is a subset of B within the yellow circle. Now what is the yellow circle? Well, some modal base, right? Uh, say, uh, your beliefs. You already know that this is not the case. Therefore, you think that the conditional is true. 
even though it could be otherwise. Right. So um, in this system, which Kratzer advocates, and which is pretty much the um, the um, generally accepted approach to conditionals, they are also interpreted as modal expressions relative to modal bases by quantification over possible worlds. All right. This is not Kratzer's idea. It came out of earlier writings by philosophers. But she uh, used this, um, her system, her modal base and ordering source system to develop an account of them. So to go back to, well, we don't need to follow this establishedly. <coughs> um, I don't need to go through the handout. So what would we say here to make this work? Suppose we have a world in here, uh, say, say it's here, I don't know. It could be outside of the yellow circle. Let, let the yellow circle be the modal base that corresponds to your beliefs. Okay, so they may be false. In that case, the world is not in there. But the world might be in there. So we have W here. And now we ask, is the conditional if A then B true at W or not? That's the question. So to uh, answer that question, we take this yellow set of worlds, which is just this, right? And then we ask within this set, is it the case that the A worlds there are, this, are a subset of the B worlds in there? Right. So it is already relative to a modal base, the interpretation of the conditional. In this case, it will turn out true, but you know, if the modal base had been over here, then it would have been false, okay? Because there are these falsifying worlds here, these A and not B worlds out here. And um, so that's the idea. We want to restrict the modal base to the A worlds and see whether they are all B worlds, right? And to do that, she proposes, here, let's see, we have, we have this F of W, and that's a set of propositions, right? Now, if you add the proposition denoted by A, I'm, so I'm, uh, I'm de deviating now from the letters that I use on this handout. I think, oh no, there's A too. Okay, A. I thought it was P. <coughs> Whatever. If you do this, which, which means just. Uh, following, right? So f of w, suppose, is these three things. I don't know. So this is f of w. And now we add a. Then before we had this set of worlds in the inter intersection, right? And after the addition of a, we have this set of worlds in the intersection, right? So what's yellow here, the, this is this, what we already had, whereas the pink worlds are this. Right? Putting in an additional proposition will result in an intersection that is at most as big as the original one, but perhaps less than that. So you are restricting the modal base to the A world by adding to the A worlds, by adding A to this modal base, right? Because now all the worlds in the intersection have to satisfy A in addition to the other propositions in the modal base. Yes, so you add A, that is the antecedent of the conditional, and then you ask, is B the consequent now true in these A worlds, in all of them, or what? Well, there we again have these different notions of strength of the uh, relation between A and B. 
right? Um, in this picture, we can just say A has to this set of A worlds, not not all of them, but this set of A worlds has to be a subset set of B worlds. That's again our universal quantification. Now we have already accounted for the fact that this can be true even though it's conceivable that worlds that there are counter worlds, but uh, we, we have not yet accounted for the fact that this may be true while this is false. Right? Uh, even if we do this restriction thing, still, with regard to this restricted set of worlds, uh, if the first one is true, the second cannot possibly be false. Because this here, uh, vacuum jumper and, and heated, this set of worlds is a subset of this set of worlds. And if this is a subset of these, then this is, of course, also a subset of these. Uh, to account for this, we can again use an ordering source, right? How can we do that? Why, why, why can it be useful? Well, I'm, I have to draw a somewhat, try and draw a bigger picture. I'm not quite sure how best to do that. Um, the model base, let the model base be something big like this. And now let's see. We have all the A worlds. And we also then have, suppose here, all the B worlds. This is just a constructed example. It can be something else. I don't know. Okay. Now, with regard to an ordering source which induces an order such that the um, minimal elements, the most likely or the most desirable or the most whatever the other thing, these uh, best worlds all show up in this area. Right. With, if you have an ordering source like that, then the conditional if A then B turns out to be a human, can, may turn out to be a human necessity, even though it's not a s simple necessity. Because again, you restrict now the model base to the A worlds, right? This is the restriction, adding A to the set of propositions that generate this model, the set of worlds. Uh, and with regard to this set of worlds now that is circled in pink, you ask, is B a human necessity or not? And it may be if, if you have some, you know, if, if the ordering source tells you that these are the worlds that count and these don't. You see that? So if your ordering source is uh, running out of colors, but if it's well yellow, let's see. You know, something like this, it has these propositions, right? So this is G of W, the white circle was F of W, now oh, actually the intersection of this, right? And the pink circle is the intersection of this. If this is the picture with these three things, you can account for the fact that A is, well, the conditional is true. Now, but why can this be false then? Well, it is. it, it can be false. If the worlds, now let me, have, let me give this a name too here. Um, so this was our A, this is our B, right? And in here we have A and some, you know, this additional proposition, call it A prime and B. 
Now, uh, the observation is that um, if A then B does not entail if A and A prime then B, how can the second one be false in this picture? Well, if A prime is perhaps whatever this, say, right? Okay. So here you have a set of worlds where the material is heated to 500 degrees, right? This is here, this, this set, right? Here you have a set of worlds where it is placed in the vacuum chamber. Those are independent. Either one can be true without the other and so on. So there are, but there is an intersection here. These are the ones where both things happen. Right? It's placed in a vacuum chamber and heated up. Both in here and in here. These are outside your epistemic modal base. So, well, fine. But restricting now the modal base to this antecedent results in a uh, set of worlds that I have no color for. Um, it is just these ones here, right? So um, this is the intersection of F W together with a and A prime, right? And now you see that the two conditionals, even though this one sentence occurs in both of them, A occurs in both of them, the two are interpreted with respect to completely different subsets of the modal base. These are the most likely A worlds and it is, that it is placed in the vacuum chamber is very unlikely. That's a very unlikely way for it to be heated. Okay? That's far-fetched. But if you insist, then I will consider these possibilities. But there are no B worlds in here. Right? So the conditional is false. But there were B worlds in here. In fact, they were all these, these ones up here. They were all B worlds. So there the conditional was true. All right, and that's quite an accomplishment to get this to work with this simple mechanism of ordering sources and modal bases. It's, it's not bad. It's pretty good. Uh, you have to admit, if or I should have said, if a, sorry, if a then b something like that. Is this pretty clear? Did you see how this worked? I went slowly, but only once. That may not be enough. What do you think? It's it's useful to be really to know. It's good if you know exactly why this happens. Yeah. So we have ruled out a problematic inference pattern. That is always a problem for logicians who deal with conditional sentences. In general, the fact that well, I have it in here, but. Um, if A then B entails A and C then B, if both of these are interpreted with regard to classical logic or with regard to the subset relation, the material conditional or strict implication, if you know these terms, then this entailment is predicted to hold. But in fact, with natural language conditionals, it doesn't hold. And um, it doesn't hold even with this kind of conditionals. You don't have to go to counterfactuals. There are counterfactual conditionals that we don't need for this. They are things like, if this material had been heated, it would have burned, right? And if it had been 